Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast, where we aim to inspire and motivate people to never give up on themselves or their dreams. We will chat with highly successful people from all walks of life and discuss what motivates and drives them to successfully attack life head on and never give up. Welcome to episode number 85 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is finding your purpose. Our quote of the day comes to us from Buddha. Your purpose in life is to find your purpose and give your whole heart and soul to it. Today's episode is sponsored by The Rocket Entrepreneur. Are you ready for a breakthrough in your business? Learn from myself and 25 other successful influencers and thought leaders sharing how to make 2018 your best year yet. We're going to give you specific advice and strategies to help you break through your plateau and make 2018 your most profitable year ever. This online event is 100% free and you can watch the interviews on your own time when it fits your schedule. The online event is called The Rocket Entrepreneur, Blast Past Plateau and Make More Money Than Ever in 2018. Please visit www.therocketentrepreneur.com. Once again, that's www.therocketentrepreneur.com. It is a complete privilege to bring you today's episode. Our guest is a gentleman by the name of John Vroman, and when it comes to the concept of paying it forward, he definitely gets it. John is the founder of the Front Row Foundation, and their mission is to help individuals and families who are braving critical challenges live life in the front row. They have helped individuals from the ages of three up to age 93. In today's episode, John shares with us the importance of being present in the moment. He also discusses how for many people, our pain becomes our purpose. I hope you enjoy today's episode and I hope you make the most of your moments today. John, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Hey, it's good to be here. I appreciate it. So the first question we ask everybody is, are you ready to bring it today? (laughs) I'm in, man. I'm here, ready to do this. I knew that would be your answer. So the number one objective of our show is to motivate and inspire listeners to never give up. And I was curious if you had either a personal story about perseverance or a challenging time that tested you and you kept on going and you didn't quit. Yeah, I love this question um, because it reminds me of, of, a, of an experience in my life that was absolutely transformative. And that was going back 12 years ago, 2005. I was asked by a buddy to run an ultra marathon. It was a 52 mile race and I had never run more than two or three miles in my entire life. And I was in a season uh, of my life at the time of really considering where limiting beliefs were holding me back and how I would push through those and challenge myself. So I was saying yes to things that previously I would have thought were totally ridiculous. And I guess, you know, it, the, the story is that I said yes to this 52 mile ultra marathon and found out that after I committed, he wanted to do this thing 16 weeks from the day we committed to doing it. So my mission was to go from being on the couch and never running more than a mile or two at a time to running a 52 mile race 16 weeks later. And the short story, and we can get into as much of this as you want, but the short story is that we trained. Um, I eventually uh, felt the pains of ramping up that fast. I had an IT band that was really acting up and I was doing everything I could do to try to make this work. I got custom orthotics made for my shoes. I got knee braces. I was doing ice baths. I was eating every type of food that was anti-inflammatory. Like I, I bought books, I studied, I read, I tried to figure it out. And with all that, I I essentially got up to about 17 miles that I could run um, about eight weeks into the training. And then what happened was I was in so much pain and my AT band hurt so bad that I had to pull out of training completely just to try to heal. And then by the time that we went and did the race, I was kind of jumping in, um, you know, without much training in the weeks prior, uh, a little bit nervous, but excited to see what was going to happen when I got out there. And what happened was I ran for the first five miles and then the pain really set in. Uh, By the time I hit 26 miles, which was six hours later, uh, I was laying on the ground, crying, grabbing my knee and thinking to myself, I can't even take another step without crying. How am I going to do another marathon on top of this? 
And what, what happened was that we, we had, we had started a charity. This is kind of like a, a side point, but it's actually the big idea. We started a charity while we were doing the training for this run because we wanted to raise money for a charity and we decided to start one. It's called Front Row Foundation. Um, and, uh, what happened was when we got to 26 miles, I remember just thinking to myself that we were raising money for people that had a life threatening illness. And no matter how much pain I was in, that my pain was only a small sample of what these people were going through that we were trying to help. They were experiencing every day of their lives. And I remember having this moment where I realized that I had this, this choice to make. I had a conversation with my knee <laughs> that we were going to do this. We're going to finish. There's no way we're not going to finish this thing. And we essentially walked the last 26, mile, the 26 miles of the marathon. It took us nine hours. And 15 hours later, we showed up on the beach. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life, not because I set any record running a 52-mile marathon, but because of who I had to become in order to do it, that what I had to keep in mind, uh, keep in my heart, what I had to recognize about my potential and, and, and what were limiting beliefs about I'm not a runner or that's not for me or I'm not capable of that. And that was a game changer in my life. So I persisted. It worked. And we were so proud of ourselves. The next year, I did another one and I shaved five hours off the time. We did it in 10 hours. Uh, and and then, uh, it, the, you know, kind of the rest is history from there. I ended up doing it again. And, you know, we, we started the charity. And now, 12 years later, the charity's raised millions of dollars and helped many people. We put kids and adults who have a life-threatening illness in the front row of their favorite event. So that's the Front Row Foundation. And that was the story, man. That's uh, That was a game changer for me. That's a great story. And I, I think it's it's just a remarkable how we talk about no quit and not giving up. And, and you clearly had a choice to make. And, you know, I'm not sure if our listeners picked up on it, but I just wanted to reiterate what you said is you were in essence in tears and you still had an entire full marathon left to go. So I think that not only talks about persistence, but also who you are. And I think the cool part about that story is that we all draw motivation, inspiration and in different things and from different people. And I think you obviously were able to put the parallel connection from your foundation that you just started to doing what you were doing and not giving up and continuing to finish again for our listeners a full marathon after you finished the first. So I think it's a great story. So I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little background about who you are and maybe, you know, going in a little bit deeper about what Front Row Foundation really does. And, and as you said, 12 years into it, it's just an amazing foundation. Yeah. So I, here's the part that I think it's relevant. So I, I grew up in a military family, wonderful parents, moved around a bunch. I was always the new kid, you know, on the block. Uh, I was very, very short in high school um, to the point to where, you know, I was very insecure. I was terrified to go to school. Um, you know, I had developed even like physical challenges as a result of being so nervous and so afraid around other people. And I, I really felt insignificant in my life. And so I think that oftentimes for many people, their pain becomes their purpose, right? Our, our greatest tra tragedy becomes our teaching moments and, and how we want to serve or, or alleviate pain for others. So my mission now is to help people feel significant and important and witnessed and recognized and loved and highlighted. That's a mission, right, of mine. And so Front Row Foundation uh, was, was part of that. You know, when we started Front Row, my buddy and I, Jamie, when we were asking ourselves, well, if you're going to start a charity, how do you determine where to, there's a lot of problems in the world, right? A lot of people need help, a lot of things worthy of your time and attention, but how do you figure out what you're destined to do? And I said, well, let's explore what is our greatest fear and what's our greatest love? Because what you're moving away from in life, you know, what you're avoiding and what you're going towards are two very uh, powerful pulls or pushes, right? And so I said, my greatest fear was just not living my life to the fullest. It was wasting this gift that I had been given, getting to the end of my life, looking back and saying, man, I wish I would have, right? I wish I would have done more, been, you know, experienced more, said yes, stepped up to the front row, right? Had the experience. I, I just fear that letting my terror get in my way. Um, my terror is the fear of terror getting in the way. And then the, the love is experiences like my greatest moments in life. The things I like to talk about the most are the times that I like celebrated life with friends. Like remember when we did that, remember where we traveled there and saw that concert or did that thing like those experiences over things. That was really important to me. 
So I said, well, what if we help people who have a life-threatening illness to have the best day of their life and then to create a community that helps them live every day in the front row, you know, to teach that what's cool about our charity is it's not just a, a wish organization, it's a life philosophy. It's like if you blended Make-A-Wish and Tony Robbins together, that's what Front Row Foundation is. And so we, we wrote about it in the Front Row Factor book. We say it's everything you can learn about living life from people who are fighting for it. And so my life as a child growing up was one of just feeling insignificant. And my mission now is to help people feel like their moments matter, their life matters, that people care about them. And that, you know, there's a lot of talk oftentimes about getting in the game. You know, we they hear that metaphor a lot of or that, that, that philosophy of like, don't be on the sidelines in life, like get in the game. I totally get it. Right. I'm with you. I like to play the game, too. I think we underestimate the power of being on the sideline and showing up for people. What we miss is that sometimes being a fan is a very important part of life, right? Being be, And being a fan, by the way, doesn't mean you're checked out. doesn't mean you're a spectator. It means you could be a participant all the way. Ask a band if they love their front row, if they if the energy that the, that the front row gives them makes the concert better. And the answer is, yeah. I mean, the best fans get the best show. And so we, we want to create a, a, a community, a culture where people, it's all about being a moment maker. And oftentimes that means putting other people in the spotlight, lifting others up, serving people. Right? That doesn't mean you not ever playing the game. It means you don't always have to be the center of attention. We get to put other people there. And when we do, we feel better ourselves. You know, when you give a standing ovation, you feel as much love and energy as that person receiving it. And the whole room is elevated. You know, and so, um, you know, that, that's that's the mission of the Front Row Foundation. And and that's why I do it, because it's really tapping into a pain I had as a child and kind of never left me. And now I just found out a more resourceful way of dealing with it than getting depressed about it. No, that's that's amazing. And I appreciate you sharing a little bit about what you, what you've done. Maybe it might be a tough question, but do you have a favorite story as far as an actual event that you put somebody in the front row for? Yeah, it, it is impossible to pick a favorite, but I can tell you one that I've told the most. And I can tell you one that made a huge, huge impact on my life. So early on, and by the way, we've done events for many people of, of different ages from, from literally age three, right, all the way up to 93. We've done events for people of, of all ages, sporting events, concerts, uh, Broadway plays, other live performances. We did a live taping of TV shows before. Anything that's a live performance where you can have a front row experience, tennis matches, whatever. Um, and so uh, early on in our in our chair, you know, in, in the mission, um, we, we heard about this little girl. Her name was Sophie. And Sophie was four. And uh, one of my friends um, who lived, this is in Philadelphia, where we started this. I now live in Austin, but uh, up in that area where we started it, my buddy John, he came to me and he's like, hey, man, he goes, I, 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 my friend's got this little girl and she's four and she's got this brain tumor and it's really like she's going through a really tough time. And she is a big, big fan of Kelly Clarkson. And I remember my, my, you know, my reactions were two. It was like, I was super sad to hear. And I think that everybody would relate to that feeling of like, when you hear of a four-year-old going through chemo and radiation and in and out of hospitals every day, right? Think about how tough life is when you get the flu for a week and think about that multiplied by every week of a year for years at times on end without going right, without going away. My heart broke. And then when I thought about doing the event, I thought, man, how big of a fan could she be at four? Is she really a raving fan of Kelly Clarkson? I mean, I met a couple of four-year-olds. I did a little homework and found out this little girl knew every word to every song. In fact, she'd cry if her mom wouldn't put on Kelly when she was in the car. So she was a mega fan. And we just knew that we had to make this possible for, for little Sophie. So our team got to work and we raised the money and we, we got the tickets from a friend because it's all about connections. And we then uh, we sent the family in a limousine to the Rainforest Cafe for dinner. Meanwhile, we're documenting the whole thing with pictures and videos. And uh, she got there. She went to the concert. It was awesome. Kelly even gave her a little like a little, a little shout out, a little little point, you know, from the stage, which was really cool. And Sophie thought it was all over when the, when the concert was done. She fell asleep in her mother's arms. She's like, that was awesome. And uh, it was over, except what she didn't know was that our buddy, John Rulin, amazing guy, author of Giftology, he got us backstage to Kelly Clarkson. And so we 
we snuck Sophie in the back. She didn't know she was sleeping in her mom's arms. And uh, we had her backstage waiting for Kelly and Kelly walks in the room and she says, hey y'all. And little Sophie just wakes up out of this deep sleep and just locks eyes with Kelly. And we have that picture uh, on my wall right now. I'm looking at it as I talk to you. It's two feet from me. And I use that photograph as a reminder as to why we do what we do. Because the look in that little girl's eyes and even the look in Kelly's eyes, that was forever embedded in my mind and in my heart as to why I'm creating these connections and these moments for people. Now, I'll tell you, the, 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 I think one of the most, imparts, most important parts of this story. So the tragic part, and the part I hate telling you and your audience is that shortly after this event, Sophie did pass away and it was crushing for everybody. Uh, you know, we, we were all, we'd grown, we loved Sophie, we'd grown connected to her and uh, that was really, really tough for everybody, clearly. One thing I'll never forget is that our event director, John Berghoff, he uh, went to Sophie's funeral and he told me that when he walked up to the viewing for Sophie, that he saw on Sophie's chest, they had laid her VIP backstage pass. And that, to me, for the family, for our, for, for our mission, was such a, was such a, we do because Sophie's mom told us that her greatest fear was that people would forget about Sophie, that her, like they would, we'd stop celebrating Sophie's life. And that hit me so deep that I knew that celebration was so important in our lives because we can use the power of past moments to, to bring energy to this one. We can bring the power of the past into now when we celebrate. And so that became a pillar of our charity and what we do. And by documenting with the pictures and the videos and the stories that we tell, we realized it wasn't just about the recipient. It was about everybody. It was about the family. Because when one person battles cancer, everybody battles cancer. And whether the person is living or they're no longer with us in this life, that celebrating their life and recognizing them was so very important. And it became just more and more clear as to why this mattered honoring somebody, lifting somebody up, putting somebody in the front row, making them feel like a rock star, you know, fulfilling dreams, and then recognizing those realities for years to come. That was what it was all about. That's an unbelievable story. And, and I think it's just remarkable. And obviously, you can't, you can't cure everybody and you can't make, make everything right. But the fact that you could share that and when John went to the funeral and he saw her VIP pass. I think that just says so much. And, and the reality is 5, 10, 15 years from now, the family's not going to remember the bad times. The family's going to remember the good times. And obviously you had not only an unbelievable impact on her life that day, but I think her parents and the rest of her family will always remember those things. So I think what you do with your foundation is, is remarkable. And we'll have the link to the foundation in the show notes. So any of our listeners that would like to either donate or get involved or just find out some more information, we'll have that as well. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I will tell you that it's, what, what you just said is so important. And that's why we say we amplify the good so we can silence what's not. And I think that's really an important lis lesson for everybody listening today is in our lives. It, it's not about um, burying things that you should be addressing or that are tough. It's it. But there is a part of life, um, you know, uh, that we amplify what's good so that we silence what isn't. It's like, I, you know, I, I use the analogy, like when I was a kid, I had a Jeep, uh, old CJ7, 1983, and this thing rattled like crazy. And I remember when I got the Jeep, I was trying to stop all the rattles. I was obsessed, right? Like that rattled over there. I was trying to stop. I was like shoving little pieces of cardboard in and foam over here and all this stuff until finally I was like, I'm just going to buy a louder radio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the minute I bought a louder radio, the problems went away. I, I could drown them out. And, and that's not avoidance. That's, that's just dealing with life in a way that we can. Sometimes we can't change it, right? My buddy Hal Elrod says, you know, one of his philosophies in life is can't change it. And, and in fact, this past year, you got a chance to put that into play. He was di diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Your audience probably knows, right? They heard him on the show. And, you know, I, I watched him from day one 
battle this thing and and put his own life philosophy into play, which is this can't change it philosophy. Hey, if I can't change it, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to amplify the good so I can silence what's not. You know, that's a key. I love that. Amplify the good so you can silence what isn't. So take a different swing here is if you had to define yourself in one word, what would that word be? If I had to define, this is good. If I had to define myself in one word, what would it be? Um, present. Yeah, present. Just being present in the moment. That That's how I'd like to, you know, I'm not always there, but that's how I would try to define my my world. No, I like that. And that's something that I personally try to do with my three kids is when I'm with them is just to be with them and put my phone down and and just eliminate distractions and really enjoy it. And I think probably all of our listeners can apply that in different areas of their life as far as just being present and enjoying the moment, whatever that is. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's I think that's the key. One of the things we talk about is personal development. And one of the things that comes up is favorite books or books that we've read recently. So I was curious if perhaps you have either a favorite book or something that you've read recently that you'd like to recommend to our listeners. Oh, do I, can, can I have an unlimited number of recommendations? Uh, It depends. uh, It depends. We'd like to keep these, these recordings, uh, you know, short. So if you have, I'm going to give you one, I'm going to give you one then go for two essentialism by Greg McEwen. Uh, who I've had on on our podcast. He's amazing. The book is stellar. Have you read that one, Essentialism? I have not. That's so good. You, yeah, I would highly recommend that. And uh, I know your audience knows how in the Miracle Morning. So any books in the Miracle Morning series are gold. You know, um, I run a dad's retreat, so I tend to recommend the Miracle Morning for parents and families. That's a good one written by my buddy Mike McCarthy and his wife, Lindsay. Um, you know, that th- those are going to be my my two. Anything in the Miracle Morning series and Essentialism by Greg McEwen. Oh, I want to give you one more. I know I'm like pushing the boundaries here. Ultra Marathon Man by Dean Carnassus. That book is a game changer. Even if you're not a runner, it's about human potential. Ultra Marathon. Who's that by again? Dean Carnassus. Awesome. I appreciate that. And, and that's one of the best parts about doing these podcasts is we interview people from all different walks of life. And for me, I end up taking a lot of notes, but I also have to then go to my Amazon and typically buy a book or two. So I appreciate, <laughs> right. I appreciate now I need to get two more books. Thanks to you. That's right. So here's, here's an interesting question for you. Assuming the 20 year old version of yourself would have actually listened. What is the one piece of advice you would have given to the 20 year old John? So I do, I love this question and let me tell you how I'd answer it. I wouldn't give myself advice. I would ask myself questions. I think that too many times we try to give advice to 20 year olds and that doesn't work. I think what we, what we can do is we can ask questions and listen. I think that questions are so very powerful. And, um, I, I felt like when I really hit it with a mentor, it was when they were posing questions and allowing me to find and seek those answers, you know? I love that. And, and I'm so glad that you touched on that because it reminds me of a great book by, by John C. Maxwell, who's actually a mentor of mine, is Great Leaders Ask Great Questions. And I think that's probably the best answer that we've received from that question about what you would ask or what you would, advice you'd give the 20-year-old version of yourself. And I think it's important that you touched on something that I want to just briefly mention is me- mentors. We often discuss mentors on, on most of our shows. And I think that's something that people miss when it comes to a mentor. A mentor is not somebody, I feel, that tells you what to do and says, okay, John, this is how you need to do it. And then once you do A and B, you move on to C. Now, I believe a mentor is there to help you and that many times can guide you. But the men- the best mentor relationships that I've had are very similar to what you mentioned is where people will listen and they'll kind of figure out what what you're trying to do or where you're trying to go. And then they'll ask you good questions. And the reason I say they'll ask you good questions because good questions lead to good answers and great questions lead to great answers. And what happens is I think the mentor-mentee relationship really takes it to a new level where you identify individually some of those answers and then you have to go out and find it as opposed to, I think, as I mentioned, most people I feel think that mentors tell you exactly what to do and how to do it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, people have said brilliant things to me over the years. Mentors have, have said things that I'm sure I processed and was very helpful, but the best conversations, the best, the best mentors have been the ones that just almost reflect or, or 
you know, they're, they're, it's not like, here's what you need to do. And by the way, if they have done it, I remember I had a, I had a mentor who sat me down and said, Hey John, I know when I was a little bit older, not when I was 20, but I was in my thirties and he said, look, I can ask you questions and let you figure out the answer. Or I can just tell you what I think you should do. I also think that's cool too. Kind of giving sometimes people a chance to, to do, to, to choose their own adventure there. And I said, yeah, I get it. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> and he goes, all right, here's what you need to do. And I was like, okay, cool. Thanks. So I think there are moments when that's possible, but I think we lean on it too much. We, we, we want to be so important to somebody that we want to tell them those magic words that change their life forever. And you know, that, I don't think that's always our role. I think we can do a lot better job listening. I'm one of my best mentors in the world, John Kane, who is the director of sales for, for Cutco Knives, known him for 20 years, and he's just an amazing soul. And I remember one time we had this great conversation. And at the end, I was like, man, that's the best conversation we've ever had. And then it hit me that he just asked like six questions. <laughs> he didn't say anything. And that was probably really tough because at any moment he could have jumped in with his own thoughts, with his, it was, you know, with, Hey, here's what that means. And here's what you should do and blah, blah, blah. But he just kept asking questions and he just said, Hey, I actually asked him about, it. I said, well, that's fascinating. I don't know if anybody's ever done that for me. And he said, I, I challenge myself at times to see how far I can go in a conversation, how long without me saying anything, just asking questions. That's a, it's a personal mission of his to see how long he can take a conversation without um, chiming in, but just asking questions. It's, it's really a good practice. That's great. You, you talked about the best conversation you had and you realized that somebody just asked you questions. So. <laughs> That's right. So we're going to take a little different spin here. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I would, I, have, I've, I haven't thought about this question in a long time. Um, my... My heart right now, man, is so conflicted, right? Because there's a million people. I would pick Derek Sivers. Do you know you know who he is, yep. Derek Sivers? Yep. He wrote a, uh, what book did he write about? Anything uh, You Want? Yep, the CD Baby guy, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think I would pick Derek right now it, to sit down with. That's that's a guy I'm fascinated by. No, that's awesome. And he's been mentioned once or twice, not as far as the dinner question, but his books have been mentioned once or twice. And actually... One individual recommended his audio book too. So that's always interesting to find that. Yeah. I like that he's a, I think he's a free thinker in the sense that he, he, when I hear him, uh, he's, he doesn't seem to be restricted by societal norms. You know, he's, he's always asking himself not, not what's on the menu, but what's in the kitchen, you know, and, and, and what, you know, how else can I construct what what I desire out of my materials that are surrounding me. That to me is a, a real creator and artist and entrepreneur. And I really am attracted to that. No, I, I like that. And I think that that's pretty interesting in many different ways. So we're going to change lanes here. And what we have is what we call the hot seat questions. And this is where we'd like to little learn a little bit more about each guest. And what we'd like to ask is just spit out whatever is the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, cool. I like it. If you knew that you only had one last meal, what would you pick for your last meal? Uh, sushi. Favorite sport? Uh, favorite sport would be running, trail running. Favorite team? Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, I'm so sorry you said that. <laughs> I, for my best friends, I have that's a that's a loyal statement right there. No, that's I'm a. I'm a, unfortunately a diehard Giants fan. This has been a very right. tough season for us. Nice. All-time favorite movie? Rudy. Oh, great movie. Your favorite book all time? Ultra Marathon Man, Dean Carnassus. Your favorite vacation spot? Shell Lake, Wisconsin, where I, I grew up as a kid grew up going to this little lake in the northwest corner. And if you were in a foxhole and you could only choose one person to have your back, who would that be? John Kane. Awesome. So before we let you go, John, I wanted to ask, is there anything that you're working on that you'd like to tell or share with our listeners? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I shared a little bit earlier about the front row and that's my life, you know, everything front row and the charity, uh, uh, as much as I can do to serve that, the charity on, in the years going forward. Um, we wrote a book about it. So the front row factor is, was a, a labor of love to your project. We're so proud of it. Um, we get into the power of hope. 
We get into the power of celebration and how to live in the moment. Ultimately, the big takeaway is how to be a moment maker, you know, how to how to make the most of all of your moments and, and your minutes that you have in this life. And they're finite, right? The one thing we all have in common is that this ride's going to end. So making the most of our time is so critically important. And I would just invite people, if, if anything I shared today resonates with you, if the values that I've talked about are something that interests you, grab the book. It's We're so proud of it. It's got 151 five-star reviews as of right now. It hit number one one on Amazon and in both categories that we're listed in. And, um, we just, we think it's, uh, we think it's a great, uh, it's great stories. They'll make you laugh. They'll make you cry and strategies, uh, in order to help you to be a moment maker. And then we tell you the science of why it all works. We give you the practical science that says, here's why celebration isn't, you know, just a fluffy term, a light term, but one that's critical to your personal and business success and why hope is critical to your business and personal success and how to use it and what's the science behind it. So man, I'd invite people to check it out. And if you do check it out, let me know. I'd love to hear what you think. That's awesome. And then for those that want to find out some more about your company, are you on social media? What's the best way for them to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Facebook mostly, uh, Instagram second. Uh, you can connect with me at John Vroman, J-O-N-V-R-O-M-A-N, or everything is linked at frontrowfactor.com. That's all the goods are there. You can get a couple free chapters of the book, um, the podcast interviews, the resources, all the events we have coming up. If you're a dad and you're out there listening, we've got a dad's retreat that we call Front Row Dads. Um, yeah. Connect with us in any way that, that serves you. That is great. And then last question, I wanted to ask if you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners. I just encourage people to um, think about those three things I talked about today when it comes to hope, celebration, and living in the moment. And just ask yourself, how might you be able to bring these more into your world so that you can not only make a difference in your own life, but to the lives of those around you. And when we when we think about the people around you, the closest people in your life, we call that your front row. We always say, who's in your front row? Who are the most important people in your life? And what are their dreams and goals? Because everybody can be a, a, a wish grantor, right? Everybody can be somebody that helps people live out their dreams. And if you want other people to help you live out your dreams, you've got to help them live out theirs. So identify your top eight people in your life, um, write them down, hang them up on your wall next to your desk or wherever you're going to see it every day in your bathroom, write down next to their names, their, their number one dream or goal that they want to achieve in life and stay after them this year and support them, lift them up, be in their front row, right? Cheer them on to achieve their biggest dreams and goals um, and use the power of hope, the anticipation principle of looking into the future, use the power of celebrating wins along the way and then remain present for the people in your life. You know, be a good listener, be there and mindful so that you can make the most of your moments, whether they're favorable or not, you know, whether, regardless of what season you're in. Um, they, you know, we say be a moment maker, right? Choose that path to be a moment maker. You know, the, your minutes don't mean anything until you make them mean something, until you choose to be a moment maker in those situations. And, uh, you know, it's, it, mean, it means even more when you do it, when it's tough to make it happen, when it seems impossible. So just get out there and give it your best shot guys. It's, uh, it's not always easy, but you know, make it meaningful. No, I, I could not agree more. It's not always easy, but it's definitely worth it in the end. Listen, John, I can't thank you enough for, for spending some time with us. You shared some, some great stuff. You shared some awesome tidbits and we'll have your, your notes in our show notes. And I really, really appreciate you being a guest with us today. Oh, this was an honor. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to episode number 85. John Vroman and the Front Row Foundation are doing some incredible things for others. During the end of our episode, John posed a question of who is in your front row. I challenge our listeners to ask yourselves two questions. Number one, who is in your front row? And number two, whose front row are you in? Think about it and take action. For the top people that are in your front row, make sure that you are in their front row as well. Support them, show them, and make sure they understand how much they mean to you. Today's call to action is very simple. Make a quick note or a list of those top people that are in your front row and decide to reach out to at least two of them today. Don't have an agenda, just do it because. Give them a call, shoot them a text, and just let them know how much you appreciate them. Pay it forward today as you go for your greatness. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit. <laughs>